All right, hey, Lugs, can you hear us? I hear you, but I can't see it. All right, I'm going to read it out for you. We're going to do this Helen Keller All style. Right. You ready? All right. Yeah. Uh, Georgia at one, Michigan at two, Ohio State at three, TCU at four, Tennessee at five, Oregon at six, USC at seven, UCLA at eight, LSU at nine, Bama at 10, Ole Miss at 11, Clemson at 12, Bishop Sycamore at 13. What do you think about the, the power rankings there? I know I, in audio, that probably helps you guys out a lot as well. Do you have any qualms with it here, Lukes, from what I just said? I think Michigan's too high at two, and I would have USC at 12 or 13. Okay. Michigan, so you think Ohio State should be in front of Michigan? I think Ohio State has more explosive capabilities that can give you advantages throughout the course of the game. Right now, Michigan does not have a great ability to create explosive plays, and they have not been a great red zone offense all year long. Um, I think that, again, given the schedule to this point, who they've played, particularly the early schedule for, for Michigan, and even Ohio State for that matter, until they play each other, they're really not going to play a team that matches up with one another mm -hmm. until it's Ohio State uh, versus Michigan. But for those areas I just mentioned, that's probably why I would give Ohio State a slight edge. Unless See it's windy and raining, and then C.J. <laughs> Stroud can't play. Hey, well, yeah, we saw what happened against Northwestern. That's what happened last year. Yeah, that's exactly what happened last year. I And and I, I'm going to take the, I'm not going to let Cone even have the opportunity to jinx Michigan here. I'm going to take this once we can move on, Cone. It's what friends do. <laughs> Friend, friends don't let friends Michigan. talk junk. Uh, Lugs, I think Michigan is more physical than Ohio State. I'm worried about the physicality be. of Ohio State. Like, I'm really legitimately worried about it. And, you know, as I watched them throughout the year, I was like, you know what? This defense, we know how talented they are. I thought the defense played really physical against Notre Dame. I thought they've set the tone a lot. But going against Northwestern, we know Northwestern's not exactly the globe trotters when it comes to spreading the ball out offensively. The weather was bad. It was windy. It was rainy. You yep. knew that Northwestern was going to run it. I knew that Northwestern was going to run it. They knew that Northwestern was going to run it. All the animals that live in my house, including the three-legged cat, knew Northwestern was going to run it, yet they were still able to find a way to push Ohio State back on multiple occasions, and they got after them a little bit up front. Are you worried a little bit about the physicality of Ohio State, Luke? Probably not overall. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm looking at, at, at college football as a whole to this point, and, you know, this is really the first time we've seen – Ohio State play down to the level of competition, is it not? I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is the really the only time they've done that. But we've seen teams do that. We've seen Georgia do it twice. Um, I think it happens sometimes. And I'm not making excuses for Ohio State, but I think throughout the course of the, of the year, you're playing a one and seven team. You're on the road. You don't look to be highly motivated or inspired. And I thought they played that way. Northwestern's got everything to gain and nothing to lose. They're they're essentially just playing for pride right now. The weather played into their advantage because it, it nullified the explosive elements of Ohio State mm -hmm. offensively. So I think it was a bit of a bad recipe, if, if you will. If, if, if you told me that Ohio State's going to go and, and play against a top five or a top ten team and that they would show up and be soft, that would really, really surprise me. Yeah, I, look, I, I agree. The recipe wasn't exactly great when you look at the weather and things like that. I just And, and it's hard to get your team up to play yeah. every game emotionally. I always say getting a team up isn't getting them excited to play. Everybody's excited to play. You have to wait a week in between games. You're excited to play. It's about execution. If everybody yeah. played as excited as they were, nobody would ever play bad. That's not how it works. Right. It's, it's being <laughs> able to execute. But speaking about execute, yeah. there's a huge one in the Big 12 this weekend. TCU goes to Texas. Quinn Ewers versus Max Duggan. That will be like a Globetrotters game offensively, at least the way it looks. How do you like the, uh, the Horn Frogs going into Austin this weekend against Quinn Ewers and the alien that is B. John Robinson? Do they have a chance to win, you think? I, I think they have a chance to win because they've shown each and every week they find ways to win. Um, now, listen, they've had some good matchups that happened to be in Eamon G. Carter Stadium there in Fort Worth that, that has, I think, given them a huge advantage. And now they're going to go on the road versus a team that and I can pretty fairly, I think I can predict exactly what could happen here with this one because this is what Texas does. Steve Sarkeesian is so good at scheming people, getting people in a position where our best guys versus your worst defender, 
we're going to get the ball to him. And he does a remarkable job of it in the first half. And if you've noticed, when he does that, he goes into the second half and he may have a 10-point lead or a 14-point lead or, as it was last week, what, a 24-point lead in Manhattan. And then all of a sudden they get in the second half and instead of just lining up and giving it to number five and just say, we're going to be better than you, he continues to try to scheme and come up with this way and that way. And then guess what? A team jumps back into it. They get back into the game, and they were fortunate to win last week. It cost them against Oklahoma State on the on, on the road three weeks ago when they were up by 14 in complete control of the game. And then you get cute in the second half. And I think the way Texas wins this game, number one, they got the best players in the, in the Big 12 overall, top to bottom. Doesn't make them the best team, but they got the best players, and they're playing at, playing at home. But how the second half plays out, in my opinion, is going to be really, really interesting mm-hmm. because number five is going to be the best player on the field for both teams. I think Quentin Johnston's a close second. But if you are if you get any type of lead, and I'm not saying you play not to lose, but I'm saying if you let's not get cute here. You get a lead against an undefeated TCU team, and you have the opportunity to line up and get the ball into the hands number five as often as you possibly can, which, by the way, they made no attempt to do at Oklahoma State, and it was one of the reasons they lost the game, then I think Texas has a great opportunity to win this one. It's like my father said when Pat Dye was with Bo Jackson at practice, somebody asked him, hey, what style of offense do you run? He pointed at Bo Jackson and said, that style. <laughs> I'd run, that, <laughs> I'd run right. that style, too, if I had Bo Jackson yeah. on my team. <laughs> no on the, and and that, you know, that gets me thinking about the, the, the Michigan point, uh, Tom. You were saying, I, I agree with you on the expo- explosive plays or lack thereof, especially through the air, but they're getting some of those explosive plays on the ground because Blake yep. Corum is that good. And what I was telling these guys is if you're a Michigan fan right now, you have to be excited that not only are you un- unbeaten, but you're playing pretty good football and balanced football sure. without sure. those explosive plays through the air because J.J. McCarthy is just missing some of those. And I think he's Mm going to start to hit some of those later in the season. But you may think I'm crazy, Tom. And some Michigan fans may think I'm crazy too. That game is on the road this year in the horseshoe, right? Which is significant. I would almost rather go there and play the Buckeyes on the road in the elements rather than play them on a neutral site indoors and allow C.J. Stroud and that elite offensive, uh, that wide receiver core to take over. What do you think about that? Well, I think based off of what we saw in Evanston, uh, you're 100% correct. I mean, that mm-hmm. that was a football team offensively that could not function uh, with elements. And when you watch, watch C.J. Stroud, I mean, I'm in my hotel room. We're out west, got SC and Cal, so we got to watch the whole day's uh, mm-hmm. allotment of games. He wasn't just missing guys. I mean, he was airmailing guys that were open, and it was mm-hmm. he couldn't control the football. Now – 30 mile per hour sustained winds. Is that going to be happening in the horseshoe? Probably, probably not, depending on if it's wet, cold, damp, what have you. That remains to be seen. But if there are conditions, which there can be at that time of the year, whether you're in Ann Arbor or you're in Columbus, then yeah, of course. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to take on an Ohio State team on an AstroTurf field under a dome. Yeah. I mean, you're it's a, it's going to be a track meet, and that's not what you want. No, exactly. Hey, LSU. Huge win over Alabama this weekend. Uh, I mean, look, two loss, two loss LSU team is now in the driver's seat in the SEC West. Looks like they have a shot to go to Atlanta, Tom. I mean, does this LSU team have a legitimate chance to win the Southeastern Conference? And if they do, would they be a shoe in for the college football playoff with two losses? Well, they have a legitimate chance if they keep playing well and they stay healthy because they're gaining confidence and they're peaking at the right time. Now, if you recall, the last team to win a national championship with two losses was LSU. Now, That's that was prior to the college football playoff, but mm. I think that the, the Southeastern Conference um, re- receives uh, so much acclaim that whether you're an undefeated one-loss or two-loss team, you're going to be in the discussion. I also think that has something to do with what else happens around the, mm-hmm. the country. You know, uh, Clemson losing helped everybody. All right, and that that was that's that was huge for the Pac-12. Could be big for the Big 12, depending on what happens with TCU. Um, but I'll tell you, man, LSU. Yeah, you know, I, I went, I watched that game. I went right to the team stats line. And there's a few that I look at because I think they matter for winning, losing turnovers. Alabama turned it over. LSU didn't. Yep. Third down conversion rate on offense. LSU was better. Rush attempts. Rush attempts was embarrassing. Alabama would not run the football. I don't know why LSU did. 
that made a huge difference uh, in, in the ball game. So there were some significant factors. Oh, and by the way, the penalty bug, that hasn't gone away either. More penalties mm-hmm. for Alabama than there was uh, for LSU. And in a game where the two teams are so evenly matched, comes down to a little mistake here or there. They won that game by one point. What if Bryce Young doesn't make the boneheaded play on the first drive of the game on the yep. four-yard line? Yep. Tom, I mean, it's, it, it comes down to little moments like that. Tom, I said I, I felt like that was the one that gave him momentum and let LSU think, hey, because remember how LSU had started games? They'd always oh, started yeah. slow. Ole Miss, Auburn, Tennessee, I can go through the list. They were on pace. They didn't go three and out. They went six and out, punted. Bama went straight down the field. It was like five plays, yeah. right on script, bang, bang, bang. Bryce tries to improvise and was like, everybody took a deep breath for LSU and was like, oh. It's still 0 0. It's, it's yeah. a football game, boys. That's it. All right. All right, Tom. I'll kind of get a little update on the highs when we talked about this earlier. Right now, you know, who do you have on the top of your Heisman list and why? Uh, Drake May. <laughs> and I, and if, if he's not in New York, I've already volunteered. Spit those Mac facts, Brown. Tom. I, 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 I told Mac Brown I would drive up from my home in Charlotte, pick him up, and drive him up to New York if I have to. Um, if you're not paying attention to what this kid's doing, this kid's going to be a top five draft pick. He is special. And he's doing it on a team that defensively has no business even probably being ranked. Mm-hmm. I mean, everything that's happening with North Carolina is because of Drake May. My close second would be Caleb Williams. Because without Caleb Williams, USC is a 500 ball club. They are so bad on defense, and it's getting completely masked by the magician that is Caleb Williams and Listen, Lincoln Riley and that staff deserve a ton of credit. Um, but wow. I mean, those two <laughs> players to me mean so much to their football team that those would be my one and two right now. Well, they said Drake was dropping an album last Saturday. I was like, y'all are crazy. I've been watching him drop a mixtape every Saturday <laughs> since the season started. All right, let's go to Dakota Blackburn. <laughs> Tommy wants to know, what do you make out of Mike Norvell's turnaround season at FSU? And do you think he's the coach to bring FSU back to the national stage? Yeah, I, I, I believe that he's more than capable of doing that. Now, they had a bad three-game skid that actually started with a game that I had at, in Wake Forest. And they unfortunately, they had to play Wake, NC State, and Clemson in a three-week stretch. And, mm-hmm. and, and, and um, NC State had Devin Leary at the time. Um, Clemson was kind of playing hot. And so if those games would have been spread out throughout the schedule, I think they'd have at least one more win. But that notwithstanding, what he's done is he's cleaned up the locker room. He's cleaned up the team dynamic. That was one of the biggest problems, if not the biggest problem prior to his arrival, is this is a football team. You'd look at them and you'd stand on the sideline. You go, they they have athletes. Mm -hmm. They've got football players. But they had I don't think they had good people. And I don't think they had a healthy locker room. And until that got changed, however it is you go about changing that, um, nothing was going to improve as far as on-field results. So he seems to have cleaned up that part of it. And, you know, they're a competitive athletic team that's capable of taking the field and playing well against everybody they play and having a chance to win against everybody everybody they play and you could not say that about that team even last year hey what's up everybody it's another call to action for you to go and subscribe do it right now i'll be waiting